The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, MetLife Insurance Limited, ABN 75004-274-882, AFSL 238096, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before before making a decision. My name is Sasha Ludkovsky and I'm a former insurance advisor and founder of The Sale Agency, where I specialise in helping financial professionals transform complex concepts into engaging content. Join me and our guests as we address the rising costs and affordability of insurance and explore strategies and solutions to help your clients meet their protection needs and help you facilitate cost-effective insurance advice. This podcast is proudly brought to you by 360 Health, MetLife's award-winning end-to-end health program designed to help your clients defend against serious health conditions so they can live healthier for longer. MetLife's 360 Health provides quick, easy and discreet access to over 50,000 leading local and global specialists, including general practitioners, doctors, psychologists, specialists and mental health clinicians. Talk to a MetLife sales manager today to find out more about how you and your clients can access expert medical support and guidance from the comfort of your own home. MetLife. Life inspired by you. Welcome to episode four in our series on how to help your clients understand and manage rising insurance costs. In today's episode, we're going to explore the global perspective and examine life and disability insurance and advisor experiences across different countries and what we can learn and apply to our advice experiences. To do that, I'm joined by Jeffrey Scott, Head of Advice Strategy at MetLife. Dr. Jeff has worked in the insurance industry for over 30 years, has 10 qualifications, and is a regular media commentator on the topics of insurance, superannuation, pensions, and finance. He has lectured at the University of Technology, Sydney, and the University of New South Wales, and created the first terminal illness benefit for life insurance products in Australia. So it's safe to say that we have an expert in our midst. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you, Sasha. So, look, let's get right into it by addressing a major pain point for advisors and their clients. What are you seeing from a pricing perspective globally, and are the pricing challenges in the Australian market unique? Um, let's just call it right out from the beginning. The answer is no, they're not unique. Whether we look at the UK, we look at South Africa, we look at um, the United States and, and again, my home country, Canada, um, we're seeing the same type of pricing changes in particular for income protection insurance. And ironically, the the same three major causes of claim are the same across. Now the percentages change a little bit, but they're the same three: so mental illness, musculoskeletal, and cancer. Those are the big three, and we see them all over. And what we found is that each of those four major area, four, four major countries, have had the same um, issues with regards to how do we get this back into profitability? What do we have to do? And they've gone through a similar trend transformation as what Australia has. So. It's been, how do we tighten up the underwriting? How do we actually increase premiums and still make them relatively affordable for clients? And how do we actually modify or change definitions so we don't get um, adverse claims experience? And so we literally see this across across the globe. Um, So what we see in Australia is not unique. Um, Matter of fact, we're probably, Australia was probably the last to move on this. So what about, you know, we've heard these concepts bandied around that Australia has one of the most generous, you know, income protection definitions or disability covered definitions in, in general. So how does that then play into the pricing? If other countries with quote unquote less generous definitions are having pricing issues, what's you know, what are our options here in Australia? Yeah. Yeah, and I think that was the thing. Is it when Australia went through their review, um, what they did was they they actually so APRA and the insurance companies and the Institute of Actuaries actually looked overseas. So they looked to see what was happening in the UK. They looked to see what was happening in South Africa. Looked to see what was happening in the United States and Canada and said, okay, what have they done with regards to their product design, with regards to their waiting periods, with regards to their types of definitions, um, and with regards to their offsets and, and also the replacement ratios to get them back into profitability. And so by learning from what other regions have done, they then brought it back to Australia. And when we saw the 
the measures that APRA um, introduced back in 2021, uh, as well as what the recommendations that came out for the Institute of Actuaries. It basically was from looking at that, basically looking outwards and seeing what that global research was before they came in to actually put the recommendations together and put those APRA measures together. So we've had this total redesign of income protection with you know a few express purposes. One of you know one of which being to get pricing and sustainability under control. There's whispers about TPD being next. Um, you know what are we seeing from a product redesign point of view? I guess globally, but also in Australia. I, I think what we one of the things I've, I noticed was that in North America in particular, income protection is primarily sold. Is primarily sold through the employers, so it's group insurance contracts through the employers, and that's one of the one of the um, benefits that the employers offer to their employees, along with health insurance. That so it becomes it becomes a, a big um, golden handcuffs they put on their their employees to make sure that they don't move or don't move as often. Um, so you see far fewer retail income protection policies being sold in the North American market, in particular. Um, in the UK, they've got a, a a market that's much similar to ours. So you you have a little bit of a little bit of employer stuff that's sold. A lot of it's sold through through um, agents and advisors, and then the South the South African market again, most of it's sold through advisors. So what you're finding is that um, since the product design, especially in North America, is primarily through the group, that's where you're seeing most of the changes occurring. And one of the biggest ones they do over there is they basically say you have to be totally disabled for the entire waiting period. It's usually. First one. Second one they say is that partial disability in many cases doesn't exist. So you're either totally disabled or not. Uh, rehabilitation retraining uh, as an intervention before you go on claim. So during that waiting period it becomes integral. And what the Americans and Canadians were doing is just saying, if we can actually get them back to gainful employment, then it basically means that they're not going to, they're going to be, they're going to so return them to health first, then wellness, then work. Then what ends up happening is we get them back in gainful employment and and, and hopefully back to um, not being on claim. So what what they're finding is far more active involvement from the insurance company and the employer to actually get them back to work. And that's why those group insurance policies over there have been so valuable. What we've also found is elsewhere around the world, so both in the UK and in particular South Africa, South Africa basically realized that where there's not an early intervention, the chances of a person going on a long-term claim is significant, which basically st- starts to have a bad influence on adverse claims experience. Because if a person gets into habitual behavior or hasn't had the right treatment or rehabilitation or retraining early enough, then effectively they get into habitual behavior with regards to not wanting to go back to work. So it's interesting to see how the various um, countries and various regions have uh, tried to address that issue. So this early intervention piece, I mean, I guess we're starting to see it a little bit with some of the insurers offering, you know, health discounts, health and wellness sort of programs. How do you see the early intervention pace evolving in Australia? MedLife has actually done this already. So we we started doing this on our on our group insurance policies, and we now brought it across the retail. Um, once we are notified that there's a potential claim, we actually have our our early intervention team contact the client and basically say to them, is there anything we can do to help you? Um, and that's usually the first thing because in, in many cases, if they've gone through a serious injury, a serious illness, um, and are prevented from working, often this is a new experience for them. And often just trying to find the right resources in their area um, to say, okay, where can I find someplace to do my washing for me or somebody who would actually, now again, with various tasks, with various um task finders and stuff that you do that people can find it far, far easier. But what we're finding now is that being able to um, connect those people to the right professionals, whether they be rehabilitation people, retraining people, um, people can assist them in their community. Um, that becomes an integral part. So people then sit back and say, I can now take action with regards to this injury or illness or disease and and basically start getting back, start, start to get my life back. Um, and we basically have that as part of our stuff at MetLife, and we're seeing that other companies are starting to do the same thing as well. In other words, once we're notified of a potential claim, before they ever see the doctor, we get involved and say, okay, can we help? And that's an integral part of this entire process. So we've talked about you know some product evolutions. What about global perspectives on underwriting, right? That's a key area where 
cost and pricing and product design comes into place? What are we seeing globally from an underwriting point of view? What I found is that there are some incredible advancements on the side of pure life insurance or death cover. Um, and some of the things I've seen overseas has been really, really exciting because what they do is they basically say that one of the barriers to people actually purchasing life insurance is a situation where people go seeing my doctor, going through all the paperwork, getting going through any writing is just a pain in the rear end. And so they go back and they say, well, is there any way to do this? So what I'm finding is that there's particular companies in the United States who basically said, if I know your postcode, I know your credit card details. And I know that you went, again, I know your prescriptions that you've had from, again, they're the biggest chemist over there is Walgreens. If we could actually download that information, we don't need you to go and see a doctor. We don't need you to take a blood test or your analysis because we have enough information to, to basically have a risk parameter built on you and we know what your risks are going to be. And so what they do is they sit back and say, you allow us to do the data scraping. Um, we do the data scraping, put it in, put it into our little black box, come out and we have a risk premium that's sp- specific for you and we can actually do this um they've been able to do it for death cover they haven't been able to do it for income protection or trauma or tpd yet um but the, what i found is that people said so to get my cover all yeah all i have to do is give you permission they go yep then we depending upon the sums insured they asked them to go into walgreens and actually have a um blood pressure test and that's it that's the total extent and walgreens literally is on each and every corner so you, you they're almost as popular as McDonald's over the United States. And so you literally walk in, do that, and everything's done. So that I find exciting because effectively what they're saying is, let's throw out the typical underwriting book that says we need to know all this information. They're saying, well, if we can do a data scrape, we don't need to ask, we don't need to ask any questions of you. And we can find out what your medical history was because of what your what your um uh prescriptions have been. We can find out what other risks you have because we take a look at your spending history or your credit cards. We, if we know what postcode you're in, we know what your risk is for that as well. That gives us a pretty good indication. That's your risk. That's your premium. So I think that what we're finding is that insurance companies are now starting to say, okay, how can we better use data um, instead of using the traditional pen and paper or an interview over the phone with a client? It's if we are if we, if we can get access to the information, then that should be um, a suitable proxy for the risk associated with a person's life. It's it's interesting. It's scary. I remember sitting in a, a conference. Oh, it would have to be five years or so at least to go now without talking about some of the data analytics coming out of the states in particular. And one of them was, you know, they can look at your postcode, link it to potential pollution in the area. You know, what's your health profile there? Things like, um, you know, maybe we can look at your credit card statements and see how often you're hitting the bottle shop things like that. So when we think about that level of analytics, and I know you're very excited about it, but are there any level of data analytics that make you uncomfortable that are concerning that you might that might not work in the Australian market? Well, the, the probably the first thing that, that worries me is, again, we have we saw this within the past 12 months, is cybersecurity. So the question then becomes is that if we give people access to this data, um, what are they going to do with it? How are they going to store it? And what's going to what's going to happen? And I think that is probably one of the, the major concerns that if I was again as a client or even as an insurance company, um, if I give you access to this data, what are you going to do with it? Then also, are you going to keep it secure? Is it going to be leaked to anybody else? What are the situations? Because we saw again, there's been four or five significant cyber breaches in the past twelve months that people have been made aware of. Um, if I've got personal data like this, then that's that's my biggest concern. And I know that. When I'm talking to my friends and colleagues across the industry at the other insurance companies, um, cybersecurity is one of the things that is one of the top of the list as far as risk to the business. So from that perspective, that's the that's probably the biggest thing I'd be worried about right now is that, yes, it'd be great to have all this data, but the question that becomes is what do you do with it? How do you store it? And more importantly, um, the the model that you have is only as good as the programming that's done to manipulate the data. And so basically garbage in, garbage out, if that's what ends up happening. So you don't want a person to be adversely affected with regards to the information that's been that's been data scraped to sit back and say, oh, we're going to do this. And I'll, I'll use myself as an example. Usually usually about once a quarter, um, I will, so around Christmas time, I will go and buy large quantities of alcohol for my friends and family. 
at during a special event. So end of financial year, I do the same thing, all the rest of it. Now, I don't drink, never have. Um, and so if people see me having these large one-off situations where I buy large quantities of alcohol from Dan Murphy's, then people could go, this guy's an alcoholic. He's going to have liver cirrhosis and have a whole bunch of other issues. Now, from that perspective, um, that is not something that's associated with me. I don't drink, don't do this stuff, but do I buy it for others? And the answer is, yeah, I buy it as gifts for other people because my friends and family drink. So from that perspective, you want to make sure that are you capturing the right data and is it skewing you in a particular manner? And it's the same thing is that, and so from that perspective, the question is, is that if you get the data, is it telling you the right story? And are you actually assessing the right risks with this particular individual? So it's making sure that that, that, that programming side of things, are you using the data appropriately for that right risk? So, and that's the thing is that for, so for death cover, it's probably fairly easy, but once you started getting into TPD or trauma or income protection, um, using that big data for that, for that information becomes probably far more difficult. So the question that I, I've asked people, is it going forward, um, coming out of COVID, what we were able to do is we were able to actually have all of our medical details on our phone. So the Medicare app, as she says, when you've had all your vaccinations, if you take a look, what it also does, it actually tells you um, when you've actually when you've actually saw your doctor. They got codes in there as well. Wouldn't it be great to have a real time situation where you can actually get all the information from when you visited your doctor being downloaded to the insurance company, and they basically say click, click, boom, and then within thirty seconds, we actually have a risk assessment done on you. That would be lovely. Now, people said prior to COVID. People said, oh, we can't get the information. It takes usually eight weeks to get it and process it and all the rest of it. Well, we now know that people have this in real time on their phones. So for me, if we start looking at data for the TPD, the trauma, the income protection, then that becomes great. The other thing is that why can't we download the person's tax returns from the ATO as well, instead of having to get the client to get it and give it to another. If we if we could actually bring that data into one space and say, okay, do the financials add up because we download it from the clients past two financial years, do the medical stuff add up from the Medicare statements. And then if they have private health insurance, we get that as well, bring it all into one situation, black box, all into what. So effectively make the processing easier for the client, make the processing easier for the advisor and have decisions instead of taking, instead of taking between four weeks to eight weeks, it takes between four minutes and eight minutes. Wouldn't that be a great situation for everybody? It would definitely definitely change things from a uh, a serviceability point of view. That that's for sure. And you're demystifying that application process and making things so much easier for everyone. But I guess the question then is, you know, behind all of that are all the various regulators behind all the various countries. So not only have we got you know financial services regulators, but you know privacy and all this and this and cybersecurity and that's its own wild west. So it's a broad question because there are so many bodies involved, but like, what are we seeing from the regulators overseas regarding things like product design, um, implementing technology like this? Is Australia behind the eight ball on this or are we leading the space? Where do we sit? Uh, quite, quite simply, um, how do I put this nicely? There is no country that's leading the charge on this, which just frustrates me. Um, now there are certain, uh, there are certain areas that you'll see. So there's a company called Lemonade over in the United States that uses behavioral finance and IT and AI and, and basically does that. But again, it's for death cover only. So there are, there are some shining lights and there are some fintechs out there as well that are trying to make this more easy and all the rest of it. But again, I haven't seen anything that actually, that you sit back and say, okay, is this, um, head and shoulders above anybody else anywhere else in the world. It's still a fairly laborious process for the underwriting. Um, underwriters is still a fairly manual situation. Now, again, I know there's electronic underwriting tools that people can use, but again, the problem with those is that you get to a certain point and you need human intervention. Um, so there's there's no there's no situation where I've seen where this has been um, this has been streamlined for all forms of insurance, the death cover or life cover, the TPD cover, trauma cover, and the income cover. Um, and that's the thing that when I'm talking to advisors, um, advisors in Australia basically said, make my life easier, make me more efficient, um, allow me to see more customers, and then make this entire process as streamlined as efficient as possible so that if I'm efficient, then I can basically 
provide better advice to, like provide more advice to more customers more often. Um, and that's currently not the process. So when I've looked around we looked around the world, there are certain things that are starting to do better. Um, I've seen a couple of bank assurance models out of Europe where the where the banks have actually got a a digital platform and they normally do it for mortgage protection insurance. Uh, where the client comes in, they take out their mortgage and effectively when they take out their mortgage, there's insurance embedded in that entire process that allows the client to effectively have their mortgage looked after. And there, there's a very strong link with that. Um, and the insurance application process is almost is actually part of the mortgage process. So it, the, the client sees it as a fairly seamless situation. But again, limited scope. Um, it's about looking after that one particular need for the client. It's not holistic. Uh, and it becomes a and it becomes a situation where those type of things is, are, are still not embedded because most clients like seeing their insurance in one in one bucket and seeing their um banking in another bucket and then their retirement and investments in the third bucket. And it's having those three things sort of interchange. The only person that does that well is often the financial advisor that brings it all together for them. Yeah. And I think it's such an interesting point that you've raised there. And I think it is all about making advice more efficient. So, you know, we're hearing so much about AI and replacing jobs and, and all that sort of fear. But I think that this financial advice profession all the technology that's coming through, through fintechs and all of that, it's all about making us more efficient. I genuinely do not believe that advisors can be replaced. Insurance, as we've as we've discussed before, is sold, it's not bought. All of the technology is all about making advice more efficient so we can see more clients, we can provide better service, we can provide uh, more cost-effective service for our own businesses. So then what would you see as some of the potential opportunities in providing advice, say, with a 10-year scope? What do you see as some major opportunity areas for advisors in enhancing their business models over the next 10 years? Um, what I'm seeing right now is that there's there's been people within Australia who are actually taking a look saying, how do we allow the advisors to get data? Um, data is king. And so the question is, how can I automate the entire process from, so let's say that I deal with four or five or six insurers. I've got customers that have each of them. Instead of me having to manually go in and download this, the client data from each of those four or five or six different insurers into my system, it happens automatically. And as part of that automatic system, we then, I know, is there been an important date that's come up with my client? So have they turned a particular age? Um, has there been a change by client circumstances? Because I've seen their salary go up. Has there been so various trigger events that basically allows me to manage that data more efficiently? So I not only know when the renewal's coming up, but I also know has the client had any problems with their payment plans? Have they had any problems? And having that data management situation, so I don't have to go in manually and do it, but the system basically has the flags in there for me to go and do it myself and manage the data for my client. So when it comes to review time, the client gets this. The information that I have is the information the client has as well. We're communicating in real time. So what ends up happening is instead of the client having to go and dig out information, dig out files and all the rest of it, they're on the same information that I am. I'm actually getting this stuff in real time from the data feeds from the insurance companies. And I'm actually able to manage this data very quickly. The other situation is with regards to underwriting. Um, the, the biggest frustration for many advisors is that I go talk to my client, go through the entire process, and then when I submit their application, it comes back as being a decline. And the client or the advisor goes, okay, I went through all this effort. It's now declined. I now have to go back to square one. Or there's there's been a loading imposed or an exclusion imposed. Having a situation where that pre-assessment can be as efficient as possible. And then hopefully electronic built in. I can put the information in. Again, we talked about downloading the information from Medicare or otherwise into the system, comes through, spits it out and says, yep, this person is likely going to be a standard situation or, you know, the person is going to be a loaded or there's going to be a loading and exclusion um, or potential decline before you ever go down the SOA path. And you then sit down, you can sit down with the client and say, here's the situation. Based on your current situation, there's going to be a loading of plus 50 or a loading of plus 100. That means your premium is going to be approximately $2,000 per year. Are you happy with that? And the client goes, yep, I'm happy. Now, 
when I sit down, the conversion rate on those clients, instead of it being one in 10, it's now seven or eight or nine out of 10 because you've done all the pre-assessments, everything comes through. And then when we're doing the reviews, if I think that my client's at a high risk of potentially lapsing because of everything else I know with that client, I can have early intervention with that client and start managing the risk and managing expectations at review time. That end-to-end process is what I've been hearing from advisors across the country. Make it easy for me to understand what the what the risks are for my client. So pre-assessments or um, underwriting rules engines become essential. And then give me as much data as I possibly can take to let me know what's going to be happening with my client. So when we have the review with my client, I can have early intervention, not 30 days out, but at three months out. So I can start setting the expectations for my clients for when that renewal comes through. Um, that's what I'm hearing loud and clear. So if I have my 10 year, 10 year plan in place, that's what I want. Digital end to end situation to make the advisors more efficient um, and to make the client experience far better as well. Yeah. And I think it's, we talk so much about data, 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 and you know, garbage in, garbage out. And sometimes I feel there's a misconception that having more data means, again, that it's a very homogenous process for a client, which isn't a bad thing. But I think the key here is the personalization. Having this data and then using that quality relevant data to actually personalize client experiences within a digital landscape is the way that advice can get ahead. That's how, you know, this industry and this profession separates itself from, you know, the direct channels, fintechs, all of that sort of thing. So if we're looking then at what's changed, I guess, globally since COVID, right? So there was a a McKinsey survey in around 2020, and this was of the European life insurance consumers, and they found, McKinsey found time that 54% of consumers in 2020 now prefer digital or direct communication channels, and that was up from 38% pre-COVID. So digital and data are two different things. Correct. So what can advisors do take, learn from that information to reinvent themselves going forward? Uh, I think that the there will be clients that still want to see you face-to-face, still want to shake your hand and actually eyeball you um, in, a, in, in an office environment. There are others that basically say, you know what, I don't have the time to actually come into your office um, or I don't have time for you to come into my house, but I do have time for us to have a chat over a computer and record this and so fa- so you're seeing far more clients that are happy doing FaceTime, happy doing WebEx, happy doing Microsoft Teams. And they sit back and say, this is actually a far more convenient way. And we can have a conversation as though I'm in your office, but I don't have to do the travel time from wherever my house is. And we can do this at times that are convenient for me. Because if people have kids, if they've got various other work commitments, they can actually flip open the computer, have this situation, and actually from a, from a digital situation, make it far more efficient. The other thing is that the advisors can record this. So everything that they're talking about with their client, they can record it and actually have it on file. And if the client, and the client says, I didn't say this, it's like, well, let's go back and review the recordings. And it's like, well, actually you did. And here's what you said. And here's what we discussed. And here's what we talked about. And it's interesting because when things go bad, what I've realized is that clients often have selective amnesia. Um, on the other hand, when things go right, the clients basically say, isn't it, isn't it great? I made such a great decision. Um, so what we have here is a situation for not only for the advisor to be more efficient, it's a better client experience for those who actually are willing to do this. It's a far more efficient situation because the client isn't having to drive in back and forth. Um, and you can do it when it's convenient for the client. So and you can share stuff on this and all the rest. And so it, so I think the digital technology of being able to contact clients anywhere in Australia, have this conversation where you don't have to be face-to-face anymore is one additional way. Now, I still, I'm a bit old school this way. I believe that the very first meeting should be face-to-face because you'd actually want to sit down and have the chat with that client. Once you get to know each other, then every other meeting after this now can be by a computer. Um, there are some clients who sit back and say, no, nah, I'm too busy. I want everything by a computer. Perfectly okay. But to build that relationship, I usually think the first meeting should be face to face, but again, a bit old school that way. And that's fine. The, the thing that I've also seen is that 
is that every piece of technology should be able to do two things. Is that if you introduce it into your practice, it should be there to enhance the customer experience and make you more efficient. That's it. Um, merely getting new technology for the sake that it's new, if it doesn't add any value to your experience, to the customer experience, it doesn't add any value to your efficiency, why do it? Um, and that's the that's the thing that I say. I've seen a lot of great technology and look at it going, okay, how does that change or improve what they're already doing? And if the answer is it doesn't, then walk away. Yeah. And I think also when we look at advice practices, it'd be amazing. It would be absolutely amazing if there was a one one size fits all, one piece of technology that did everything for us. But we know that's just not possible. So, you know, we do have to invest um, knowledge and trial and error in a tech stack, right? We know businesses are made up of several pieces of technology that enhance the efficiency overall. Unfortunately, there is not one size fits all solution that provides everything that we want. Look, changing tack a little bit, looking at that global perspective again, are there any absolute disasters in other markets, regulatory, product, data, otherwise, that you've seen happen that we can learn from? Well, I, th I think the very first one was one that happened probably about eight or nine years ago over in the UK. And what happened over there was that the UK banned commissions, full stop, and insurance sales plummeted. And then they realized, oops, we think we've done a, we've done a disservice here and reintroduced them. And what I've realized is that when it comes to commissions, especially for risk products, it should be one of the options on the table. Now, does it have to be the only way you're, you're that an advisor's paid. No, if an advisor wishes to do fee for service and the client's happy, that's great. If they want to do commission, that's great. If there's some other remuneration method that they want to do that's that the client is happy to pay, not a problem. But what I found is that when that occurred, literally sales fell off the cliff and then they realized, oops, we've gone too far. Um, so I'm very happy that Michelle Levy and the recommendations that she had in the QAR report was commissions for risk products stay. And then the government basically reinforced that with their um, endorsement of that back in June on the QAR. So I'm I'm glad that's one of the things because again the disaster that I saw in the UK about a decade ago when they said all commissions got banned, risk commissions literally fell off the cliff, and it took them a it took them a number of years to recover. So for for me that's that's one of the things. The other thing that I found is that in many in many um, countries, whole of life is still the predominant type of life insurance. And the reason for that is that when I looked at at the reason why, in many cases, it allows them allows people to pay off death taxes. So th there's still death taxes or uh, estate taxes with, in many jurisdictions, and it allows people to actually do this. The other thing is that the, the whole life policies are true level premiums. So effectively, you pay the one premium in year one, and it's the same premium all the way through for the rest of your life. It then gets, it starts off with high risk amount, then it gets a high investment amount. And at the end, it's, it costs between four savings and risk management, which is a great situation. But it means that for people who, as they get older, premiums become less, less, um, less affordable. You actually have a policy that you allow to have a level premium for life. It doesn't go up and uh, you have this policy that sticks around for as long as you want it to stick around. I think, and I think looking at whether it be a whole of life or um, a, a unit link policy or one of those solid policies, having them being reintroduced into the Australian marketplace, I think would be a wonderful idea. All right. We're drawing towards the end of our of our podcast, but I just thought we'd close out with one question. And it's a broad one. It's a big one. The, the answer could be 10 minutes long. We don't know where this is going to go. But look, there is there are so many learnings and really, you know, we've got two distinct markets. We've got developed insurance markets, developing insurance markets around the world. If there was one key learning that we could take from another market and apply it to the Australian one on top of the lessons we've already covered so far, what would you say is your key learning that we could apply to the Australian insurance market? What I've found is that in almost every market around Australia, around the world, is that when you link insurance to something that's important, you get more insurance sold and it sticks for longer. And the 
in the various areas that seem to do this well is every time that when a person has a mortgage, you sit back and you say, now is when we have to have that discussion with you. Um, and what I've seen is that from a retail perspective, the number of sales that are off the backs of mortgages are incredible. And so basically people sit back and say, yes, I need to protect the mortgage and I need to protect everything else that goes along with it. So let's make sure we get all the insurances in place. So tre- a tremendous link between the lending situation and protecting that potential debt and liability. The other thing is that where I found if people don't f- see that link, then very few people actually will take the initiative by themselves. And so what I found is that no matter where you are in the world, having an advisor or an or insurance agent or a broker who actually comes in and says, let's sit down and have this chat. They are essential to making sure that you get the right amount of cover for your particular circumstances and making sure it's affordable. Um, those two are important. And then making sure that there's default cover elsewhere. And what I found is that through your employers in Australia, employer cover is a very small fraction where almost everywhere else in the world, if you are if you are working for a particular employer, most employers uh, want to protect their employees because it's a good investment. And often the insurance packages for death cover, income protection cover um, is are also, are, and health, health insurance are often quite significant. Now, people say, well, there's fringe benefits tax if that's situation here in Australia and there's all, but the, what we've done is we sort of half put it inside superannuation, but the, there's the trustees now in Australia are finding it difficult to make that affordable for your clients and comprehensive enough. I think what we should probably do is move it back to the responsibility of the employer to get a good base level or default level cover, and then making sure that it gets customized, have the advisor involved, and especially every time the person takes out a mortgage. So having those components there, good default level of cover, especially through the employer is one. Uh, two, you need to have an advisor involved. Otherwise, people are people do not take action with regards to their life insurance. And three, try and link it to the person's mortgages because when that ends up happening, um, people often see the need immediately because it's linked to something that is actually tangible for them. Dr. Jeffrey Scott, thank you so much for joining us on this podcast and sharing your global insights with us. Now, if our listeners wish to connect with you on LinkedIn, can they do so? Absolutely. Excellent. So there you go, listeners. If you want to go connect with Dr. Jeffrey Scott, uh, you can do that. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Sasha. 